I remember Freddie Mishlak was someone who I used to really look up to growing up, and uh, he was, you know, at the other end of his career, and he came into the into the change room afterwards and said, "Look, he'd heard that it was my first cap, and he chatted briefly in my pigeon French and his pigeon English, and he gave me his jersey, which I thought was really classy, and a moment that I'll never forget." House of Rugby Ireland here on Joe, together with Guinness, game changed. Hello and you are very welcome to House of Rugby here on Joe together with Guinness. I'm Emer Constantine and I am joined as always by Ian Madigan. On today's show we have Leinster and Irish centre Sene Naupu and we are very excited to chat to her. However before we get on to Sene, Ian we're going to chat a little bit about the English game. What do you feel on the Monday after a defeat like that? Yeah, it's tough after a game like that. You know, you come back in having played and, you know, I'm sure most of the lads' phones were pretty quiet and then you obviously have to wear every time you bump into someone on the street or any time you turn on your phone, you're seeing, you know, the negative kind of media reviews of the game. But, you know, for me, that was never the, the hardest part. The hardest part was always getting in and, and waiting for that review. And that's what I'd be, you know, stressing myself out over, going over in my mind, you know, what clips, you know, the coaches are going to bring up. Um, everything from you know how a coach looks at you when he first sees you on a Monday morning, you can almost get a vibe off him. Then, you know, geez, this is very negative. He obviously thought I had a poor performance, you know, individually, or he felt poorly about the team. And then, you know, you get into the nitty gritty of the review, which you know you're, you're going to find out very quickly who you think is going to get another chance, you know, for redemption the following week. And you're thinking in your in your own head, oh, maybe they actually thought I did some positive things and I could be on for another chance here. Um, I suppose for you, off the back of you know a tough performance, what what would your kind of mindset be? I suppose it depends, doesn't it, on when you've a game or or if that's the end. You know, I know in 2018 we finished the Six Nations with our with our last, or 2019 we finished with our worst ever finish in the Six Nations, and we lost to Wales, and then you have to wait a whole year to rectify that. So I think Ireland are in a good position that. You know they have Georgia next weekend, and that they have a chance to and an opportunity to rectify and to actually build on that and to prove themselves the guys that won't be happy with that performance that they just had. So I suppose it depends on the situation and what kind of a game you have. But I suppose there's never it's never easy sipping into that um, analysis room. You know you're always tougher on yourself. I feel like than your coaches are, even though God sometimes I've got slayed it inside there and. You know, you don't know whether to laugh or cry because it's it's awful. And and I suppose you're getting it from not just your coaches, you're getting it from the media, you're getting it from the from external sources like that. And it's difficult. I know I know we say like not to look at it and we say not to read those comments, but you always find yourself and I don't know, do you do it too? But like I find myself looking for the bad stuff and you look for the negative feedback and which makes you worse. You know, there's no benefit in doing that. But I suppose it's easy for people to hide behind a screen and to and to say those negative comments. But you do it's it's hard to pick yourself up like those days are difficult to pick yourself up from but i suppose the english boys will be delighted with that performance and will have huge pot like momentum going into the next game but the irish boys and they'll they'll need a good performance and a, and a good game against georgia next week yeah like there's, there's no doubt in the effort at the weekend and you look at the stats after the game you know, we, we put them under a huge amount of pressure. We, you know, they they to make, I think, three times the amount of tackles that we made. Um, and I'm sure that a lot of the Irish bodies are, are, are going to be stiff and sore off the back of that, which can, can make it tough to, to bounce back. The first thing you want to do is get back in, get training, get a good training week together and lead into a good performance. Um, I definitely think one of the things that they're going to look at is, you know, when someone makes a mistake in the team, which is what which is going to happen. It happens every single game. It's how you cover up your teammates' mistake. And, you know, we saw in the French game, you know, Jacob had one or two mistakes at the back that, you know, subsequently led to tries. And that has a negative effect on, on the game. Similar in the English game, you look at that line out in the first half, a simple overthrow, maybe the lift wasn't perfect. Maybe Pete could have caught the ball. Um, that leads on to, you know, Farrell getting inside out by one of the best attackers in the, in the world and Johnny May. And then he scores what was, you know, one of the best tries I think we'll see this year. But it, it's very tough in a game like that in the first half when you concede a try that's off the back of individual errors. It's 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 hard to wear those. You know, they carry you carry them with you for five, ten minutes within a game. Everyone's got their heads down behind the posts. Whereas 
you know, let's say the centre picked up that overthrow off the back of the line out, Ireland got their pick and go game going and scored a try off it, then those mistakes are forgotten about. And, it, you know, it almost has a positive influence on the team. So I, I definitely think that that's an area that they'll look to, to kind of tidy up, being able to cover cover the mistakes as best as possible. Absolutely. Um, I know I watched that try back again and the handoff on Farrell. Like Farrell is twice his size, but Johnny May's footwork to get on the outside of him and to get that to get that handoff, like it was phenomenal. And then just to take the gap, you know, it's textbook rugby. You know, he got he got a soft shoulder, he got a fend on him, and then he took the gap and and finished it extremely well. And I suppose there was some amazing English performances there. And going back to last week with Hugo, he said that the the lines test would contain I suppose the whole pack that whole English pack and based on that performance at the weekend I think he was right what do you think yeah well, I, I think I think you know the English back row is incredibly strong um at the moment even if you look at the guys who aren't in the squad you know um or even the guys who are coming off the bench like the likes of Ben Earl you, you see him him coming on and just going geez it's just endless the talent they have there but I think at the same time, you, you look at, you know, Caelan Doris the weekend. He was a you know real standout performer for us. Um, he's someone every time he carries the ball, he seems to find, you know, an extra three, four, five yards when he's engaged contact, which creates, you know, quick ball, go forward ball for the backs or forwards who are carrying again. You know, he's someone who, if he can keep building on the, the early form he's shown this season, there's no reason why he can't um, put his hand up for line selection and, you know, there's there's plenty of other performers in that Irish pack that um, I think you know in in the front row. I, th- I thought Porter was very good again. You know, he went to full stretch at eighty, which you know showed how fit he is. Um, Keen Healy will be right there again, you know, without doubt. Um, but yeah, no, it is. It's it's tough off the back of a game like that when you know England had physical dominance for for large parts of it to, to kind of to, to figure out how Ireland can kind of make up that gap. Going back to the Guinness Six Nations, Andy Farrell does back his team and he thinks that, you know, they are within a chance of, of winning that Six Nations and competing for the Six Nations. We have France and we have England at home next year. But honestly, what are our chances? Like what has to change in order for us to get a win against France and against England next year? Yeah, certainly. Like I, I, I would agree with him. Um, you know, I think we start off with with Wales away. I, th- I think we have we've had Wales as number for, you know the last couple of years, the last few times we've, we've played them. Um, they're a side that's d- definitely in transition at the moment. So you, you know, it'll be interesting to see how much they improve. But if you can go away to the Millennium Stadium and pick up a win there, I think we've Italy in the second game. You know, suddenly you're two from two, and then we've got England and France at home, where you know traditionally in the last few years we've be, we've been very good. Um, you know, saying that there's there's no doubt that there there needs to be Im- improvements made in, in how we're playing. Um, but if if you can get tweaks and 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 find ways to generate that front foot ball, that's the key, and that starts at the set piece. The set piece didn't click at the weekend, be it line out or scrum. Off the back of that, the back struggled to get go forward ball, which made the carries much more difficult for, for the forwards. But if you if that set piece, which it will, clicks and provides a good platform. I think we've seen glimpses over the last few weeks um, of, you know, the creative plays we saw against Wales, um, you know, clever little movements, getting our blind winger in, getting second touches with our nine or our 10, and, you know, really challenging defences that way. With our set piece taken away at the weekend, we weren't able to show that. But, you know, I think, um, you know, given another couple of weeks of the automations, a few prep weeks, there's no reason why Ireland can't be, you know, back to their very best like we saw before the World Cup. I absolutely agree. And I think that these games are the opportunities that those young and kind of suppose, in, not inexperienced boys, but those boys will get great experience playing in the Autumn Nations. And I suppose Georgia next week is, I think, a game that we might see a lot of new new players, maybe guys that are uncapped. Um, I personally would love to see Shane Daly getting a go. You know, he's a Munster guy who has really impressed up, up, up until this point. And... You know, 15, the 15 position isn't really locked down at the moment. And I think there still is room for a bit of movement there. But who are the guys that you think, well, that you'd like to see next weekend against Georgia or get that chance? Yeah, certainly. I, I think Shane Daly is definitely someone who, who's earned earned his opportunity to, to get a run out um, for Ireland. I Personally, I'd love to see Stu McCluskey ha- have a go. I think he's he's someone who offers something slightly different to the centres that have been playing there, you know, be it Gary, Bundy or, or, or Farrell um, in recent weeks, 
Um, for me, looking from the outside in over the last few years, you know, he runs that kind of nine, twelve, kind of out the back play to the, the to the ten or the winger. He's probably the best in the country at that. You know, the way he he commits defenders, his accuracy with the pass, and also if he doesn't think it's on, his ability to carry. You know, he's a really really strong guy. He's got subtle footwork. Um, you know, he finds a lot of you know soft shoulders within a game. And he's someone who you can go to time after time, and, and he's you know incredibly consistent. So, I think it would be good to see what what he can offer Ireland, and, and and see if it's you know a slightly different attack that he can bring. I think tied in with that himself, and obviously Billy have been playing together for the last few years. Um, you know, to to see what that combination can can, can offer, um, I think would would be really exciting. Absolutely. Well, we'll leave it there for part one, and we'll be back with Senny for a chat in part two. House of Rugby Ireland, here on Joe, together with Guinness. Game changed. So, Senna, how have you been throughout the lockdown? I suppose it was a difficult period for all of us, but in particular you, you went through that surgery after the English game. So how have you been after that? Oh, I've been, I've been good, Eames. Like, honestly, um, challenging time for everybody. A um, few differences in my voice, so apologies in advance for... Uh, you know, people who might have known me before, I was a bit louder then, so I'm a little bit uh, hoarse these days. Um, so, but otherwise, all good. Thanks. I really want to get into your rugby journey, and we will get to that at the end of the show. However, we're going to start off, I suppose, with the the game at the weekend. It's fresh in our minds. It's, it's Monday after the, the match on a Saturday. So, I suppose, initial first impressions of that Irish defeat to England. Sene, what did you, what did you think about that? Well, firstly, fair play for... Uh... James Ryan, you know, having the honours of captain Ireland for her. And at that age against England and took him, massive challenge um, for the boys in general. So, um, yeah, tough day out for the for the lads. I think uh, England obviously uh, showed their dominance on both sides of the ball. And um, at the end of the day, you know, the team that wins momentum on attack and the team that wins momentum on defence and wins collisions, um, as well as the team this is a quote from Ed, from Eddie Jones, who said the team that kicks the most wins. Um, they actually proved that on the day, but, um, you know, we showed some glimpses of uh, positive play as well from, from Ireland, so I'm, I'm sure that they'll be uh, working to build on those. Ian, James Ryan obviously was captain. Had, had you played much rugby with him at Leinster? And I suppose, did at a young age, did he look like he was going to slot into that position? You know, you would have, if you had played with him, what kind of a player was he to play with? Yeah, um, first of all, great to have you on the show, Sene. Great to have you on. Um, yeah, James was just coming through the academy when um, when I left. He was kind of just leaving school. But even then, I remember there was word coming through this, you know, second row from St. Michael's was the next big thing. Um, I remember being in, in the gym one of the days and he came in and I was just looking at him. I think he was maybe 18 at the time and just going, he's a huge man for someone who's coming out of school. And even then, he looked physically like someone who could play professionally you know within probably a year and, and you know very quickly he did that um but i think you know he, he he nearly played i think for ireland before he played for leinster and then once he started playing for leinster he went on this crazy win streak of something like 25 games in a row unbeaten and you know winning um you know plenty of trophies along the way you know, at the start of his career. So it's, it's been a kind of natural progression for him to get to this point as, as Ireland captain. And I definitely think looking forward, he, he, he is the man, you know, to be leading Ireland going forward. Um, you know, maybe not immediately now with the way the, the opportunity presented itself. I think it was it was the right, he was the right guy to go with, with you know, the likes of Peter Mahoney kind of backing him up. Um, and look, I, you know, looking from the outside in, I love seeing the fight with him and, you know, the, he, he could, there was no doubting, there was massive kind of will to win and he was very passionate, but um, I think tied in with that was maybe he might have forced things a small bit. You know, he's, he, he's an incredibly disciplined player and his stats are always through the roof. You know, he's one of the highest tackle counts. He hits a lot of rooks. He gets through a huge amount of, of carries. Um, but I think he gave away four penalties in the game, which is unlike him. And, Maybe he wasn't trusting his instincts as, as well as he would have done done previously, and I think the frustration of how the game was going probably you know got to him a small bit. But there's no doubting he'd he'd have learned a huge amount from from that game, and um, 
you know, hopefully a slightly easier prospect for him to, to lead Ireland this weekend. Yeah, and I did feel in the first half, you know, when we when we kicked the ball and when we looked for the space in behind in the backfield and played played that game, we were very much in the game and England couldn't really deal with it. And it's it's interesting, I suppose, well, what the thought process is behind it as to why we didn't continue that kicking game. You know, obviously, it's very easy us looking on from the outside, but I felt like that kicking game was working originally. And I suppose the heat of the moment, it's hard to see that. But it's interesting that they didn't continue with that kicking game, isn't it? Yeah, I think it can be hard as well. You fall behind on the scoreboard and, you know, the game plan beforehand is to, is to kick the ball a lot, try and pay, play a territory game. But when you go five points down, 10 points down, 15 down, you know, it takes a lot to stick with that kicking game plan. Um, you know, the, the natural instinct in, as players is, right, it's time to start chasing this game and, and you know, maybe playing from your own 10-metre line or your own halfway line. And England, were, they were just so strong and so physical and got over the ball so well that if they force you to play from the wrong areas and you're then getting turned over, before you know it, you're defending a five-metre line out. Um, and that's that's ultimately what England did at the weekend. You know, they, they didn't really allow Ireland to get into the 22 until, you know, deep into the second half. And at that stage, it was, it was probably too late. So what you're saying, Ian, from... A you know, side set piece and open play. I thought it was really interesting um, watching the differences between Ireland's attack and then England's attack from second secondary lines of attack. Um, so, you know, slipping in the back door, the detail that I thought England executed really well was how um, the, the depth, how flat that back person was, the, the back door was tucked in behind the first ball carrier so that when that short line comes, it actually gets that that gap in between the third defender, um, third or fourth yeah. defender, whereas, say, against, um, say, in other situations where maybe there might have been opportunities out wide, just the detail and the, the spacing and those sorts of things. But overall, what it did for England is it got it wide. So when it does get it wide, then they'll pick on Hugo for those kicks. So I, I felt that it was a busy day for for our for our, for our boys in the back three. Um, and but the fact that they were able to get the edges and the way they were executing some of the basic second lines of attack was um, quite pretty to watch, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'd agree with that. I think when you've got guys of the, of the you know, the, the strength and power of the English pack running those kind of hard down lines back against the grain, as the Irish defenders have to respect the front door option. And then when it goes tight kind of out the back, whether it's to a winger or a centre, it does kind of split the defence. And I thought they did that really well. Um, but yeah, on the back three stuff, uh, Imer, how do you think Hugo got on? Yeah, like I think he did well. I think he dealt with the high ball well. I think they did pick on him with those kicks and I think they did target him as a 15. Um, I think he, bar one, I think bar one mistake, I think he dealt with him pretty well, but they just hammered him. Like he did not have a second. He was barely on the ground and they had him hit. There was two, there was three around him. And I think they targeted him, not so much in the air, but I think they targeted him on the ground and his ability to get the ball back. And they probably looked at Ireland and realised that our support to Hugo was slow the last day. Um, and it resulted in a few turnovers. But I think overall he did well. You know, he was limited. He had very limited space with to do anything with the ball once he did gather it, but he did deal with those um, high kicks very well. So I think it wasn't it wasn't because he had a bad performance at Stockdale come on. I think they just need I think he was just battered for a finish. You know, he took some he took some serious hits there. But yeah, it was great to see Earlsy back. I obviously am a big fan of him and uh you know, he did he did have an impact and I suppose the steady head and the experienced head of him there was was a great addition to the team and I suppose even for James Ryan to have someone like Earlsey on the field with the experience that he has, along with CJ and Long Peter Amani, you know, there's plenty of leaders out there and I think the young boys stood up. I think that was the main thing, you know, we did see Caelan Doris have a great game. I think Hugo Keenan did well, dealt with dealt with what he had to Kelleher, yes, could have made probably better decisions, but I think all in all you know, you have to look forward and there's no point looking back. And I think the future is bright. And I suppose that's the positives that we can take from the game. Yeah, certainly. I think I thought Caelan Doris was brilliant again. Um, you know, he offered something a bit different at, 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 at number eight. He's got great footwork. He's got a good offloading game. He's someone who, like, it, it looks like he's going to get brought down to ground and he always seems to be able to find an extra three, four, five metres, which then makes that rook ball much quicker and provide, you know, 
back with the other forwards carrying the much better opportunity to carry the ball. Um, I think at the moment it's, it's probably figuring out who are the best guys to go with him because he's probably the you know the informed back row in, in Ireland at the moment. Um, I know Reese Ruddock's tearing up trees for, for Leinster week in, week out. You know, you wonder is there is there space for him to, to fit in? Um, you know, and even even up in Ulster, like Sean Reedy's been fantastic for us. Um, week in, week out, I think he's picked up like three man of the matches in out of the, the seven games we've played. So you know, you, I I definitely think there's, there's guys breeding down the next of the back row that are that are there, um, which is great for competition. Well, anyway, hopefully Ireland can pick up a win at the weekend against Georgia. Sene, you joined us on the show back in 2018, but for anyone who hasn't been listening or doesn't know your background, can you, I suppose, tell us a little bit about how you ended up here and your journey from New Zealand all the way to Ireland? Oh, my ticket to go away, was it? <laughs> <laughs> Connacht Rugby was uh, the ticket overseas. Yeah, moved over there about 10, 10 years ago now, or altogether, I think it is to go away first um, from New Zealand. Um, short stint here for six months, uh, Japan for a year and then moved back to go away in Connacht for another five and a half seasons. Then a season with Harlequins in London and then back to Dublin 2017. And um, we've been in, in Dublin or the Leinster area ever since. So um, yeah, so it's, been, so it's been a good adventure so far. It absolutely has. So tell me a little bit about, I suppose, growing up in New Zealand and the other sports and the background. And so as you're raised by an amazing woman, I'm, I can say the same thing. Um, but just, I suppose, growing up in New Zealand, what was it like and, and how different is it to here? Oh, you must give a shout out to, to Mummy Kay. Gosh, <laughs> yeah. your mum. She'll kill um, me. Yeah, I haven't was... mentioned her yet. <laughs> um, yeah. Ian, have you been to, you've been to New Zealand, actually? I think you have. No, I haven't. Um, I haven't. Uh, it's um, really similar to Ireland, obviously, but just it's similar to Ireland. It's just obviously it's a bit warmer. It doesn't rain as much. But um, yeah, the outdoorsy growing up, played all sports and uh, eventually was lured into rugby. Loved it and um, yeah, kind of stuck with it ever since, really. Um, basketball was my first sport, but, um, you know, overall just really enjoyed playing rugby and being involved in the community and those sorts of things. And you played at a pretty high level at basketball, didn't you? Oh, like age group when I was like 12 years old or 13 years old. <laughs> um, yeah, but in terms of like, uh, you know, uh, transferable skills, basketball is really helpful for, you know, other sorts of sports, especially rugby. But um, yeah, like I loved volleyball and athletics and softball um cricket backdoor cricket so like loads of the sports um everyone pretty much played everything quite similar here to to Irish kids too it is yeah and I I think and obviously we we had a discussion on the show a few weeks back about how our skills transferred over but um you're probably very similar and we can see those skills obviously on the rugby field with you but it was what changed your like what enticed you to play rugby when you got to Ireland you played with I think Galwegians originally and then Connacht and um obviously on the Irish sevens and fifteens teams but what I suppose initially spurred you to to go back and play rugby um that's a super question uh because I thought I retired at that stage I thought it was over I was gonna you know move forward on the next chapter of my life but um yeah at the time I felt that I I genuinely had more to give to the sport and I think I'd gone through so much before that, that um, it was now or never really. So yeah, put everything into um, training and, you know, trying to get involved and get selected for the squad for sevens and kind of grew from there really. And I've loved like, you know, learning different things about the game all the time. And um, I suppose now here we are. And now we're playing together for 15 Zimmer, so uh, <laughs> I know a, we started a funny old journey. It's funny that you you thought you had retired. Like it's it's mental to think that 10 years on you're here with the captains, captaincy of Leinster, captained Ireland at some stages, you know, a leader on our team, a leader on a lot of teams. And to think that, you know, you could almost not be here playing this game, which is really, really strange. But I remember my first um, sevens tournament I actually we went to San Diego and I sat on the plane beside you 
I hadn't a clue about rugby, like genuinely not one idea. I got landed on this last minute flight. I think someone got injured and I ended up going. But from the very first day, I feel like you've been involved in my rugby career. And then I thought it was very appropriate that you and I roomed together when we were in Dubai for our very first World Series Sevens caps. Um, that was a very special moment, wasn't it? Dubai Sevens is a great, um, it's a great one if you're a supporter and it's equally great if you're a player as well. Oh, it was such a special, special league that was in Dubai and really cool to be with you too. I've still got the photos of us taking oh selfies gosh. in the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> um, that sounds about right. God, how far do you stand it, stand it. But um, Ian, you'll know from playing a bit of sevens probably in your career. Um, yeah, plenty of selfie photos. I'm in the sevens, but... Um, um, we did do some training over there too, though. Um, yeah, that was, uh, that was a cool uh, experience, wasn't it, in Dubai? I, I had, yeah. Gohan, um, and a lot of the girls kind of, yeah, helping us in that particular tournament as our first tournament. So, uh, cheapest, that was a while ago. I remember Ali Miller gave me a dead leg in training and I was like this is my first cap my first world series cap and Ali Miller's after giving me a dead leg like nothing surprised me more than her doing that and I remember I had the game ready just trying to get on the field um trying to get myself in the field Ian did you ever um see anything about the Dubai sevens like it was just party central and I just couldn't understand that like this went hand in hand at rugby it was my very first tournament yeah I'd I'd, I'd have Followed the, the World Series and, and I enjoy watching the sevens, but um, never, it was it wasn't really an option for me to, to play because um, it wasn't a, me, a men seven sevens team when I was let's say coming through the academy or in, in the earlier years. But it definitely was something I would have loved to have done if I could turn back the clock. Now the, the under twenties was probably the main focus for a team, and, and that's a great program in itself. Um, but I definitely think now like the the men's national team is beginning to get the fruits of the investment that they've made in the seventh program with like the likes of Will Connors coming through, Hugo Keane and um, and I'm sure we're gonna see it, you know, a spade of others coming through and, and, and similar for, for the women's game. Like for you guys, you know, you both came through the sevens program and onto the fifteens and you know, I think it's fantastic for the core skills of the game, you know, your your tackling, your passing, your communicating, you know, your fitness. Um but I suppose as well, a question for, for you, Sene, like, did you find from, from doing the sevens program and then going to the 15s program, physically, did you, did you, did you feel that you had to make a change to be, you know, stronger for the more physical carries, especially when you were playing in the center? Great question. Um, initially, not really, as in, you know, the, we were going in between world series and then um, I was fortunate to be, and the email was the same as in Selected for Six Nations. So it was kind of in between the um, the sevens. So we still had to, yeah. you know, ensure that we had the demands of sevens as well. It probably wasn't until I finished playing sevens when, you know, fully focused on 15s that, um, yeah, I probably, you know, had a bit more of a an awareness of like, you know, certain size or whatever it is to fulfill a certain role or whatever it is. Uh, but that was probably more myself as opposed to it being forced on from like an SEC point of view type thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what about, what about I, certainly, yeah. Yeah. I know when I first joined Sevens, I obviously came from Gaelic football and I think I was around seven, 62 kg at the time and the SNC at the time wanted me to put on a lot of weight and I actually went from 62 to 72 in probably two to three years and that was like 10 kg which is a lot of weight to put on but I suppose it wasn't all muscle and I wasn't really happy with where I was at the time and <laughs> over the last few years I've only got to <laughs> it definitely wasn't all muscle um but over the last few years I've I've got to a stage where you know I know I'm at the 70 69 kg and I think that's where I'm happy but I think there is I think 15s does provide you with different demands to the sevens series but or to the sevens demands but i think you know that's one thing as well i think as female rugby players there is different body shapes and there is different demands for different positions and i know just from chatting to leah and the girls over in england that i don't think you'd make an english front row if you weren't more than 80 kg you know there's demands in certain positions and it's really interesting coming from gaelic football where everyone 
is very similar. Maybe your midfielder might be slightly taller. But in general, everyone is the same size. And I so people don't realise the demands that your sport has and that I'm 10 kg heavier as a result of the sport that I play right now. But Ian, did you have to put on any... I don't know, was it the same for you when you first joined? I suppose we look at Hugo Keenan, he probably could do with a bit more weight um, at 15. Yeah, like uh, Hugo's a great example because when he's playing sevens, you know, if, if he was, let's say, a stone heavier, so seven kilos heavier, it's a lot of weight for him to be carrying with the amount of distance he's got to cover and the turn, you know, the turnaround with games. You don't want to be carrying that extra weight. But then when you come across to to 15s, you've, I think you now, obviously, I don't have much experience with, with playing sevens, but I, I know from the 15s game, a lot of the tackles that you're um, receiving, it's two on one a lot of the time. You, you know, it's a different kind of tackle where you're waiting for your support runners to come in. You've got to keep driving your feet. Um, rucking itself is, is I think, um, it's much more of a contest each time because there's not as much of a jackal focus in, in the sevens. Um, yeah, Hugo's probably someone who, you know, maybe an extra three or four kilos it will be no harm, no harm for him to put on. But yeah, for me coming through, like like most of the guys in the academy, I would have been, I don't know, maybe eighty kilos leaving school, and very quickly they said, yeah, look, you know, you need to put on weight, which I knew. Like if I wanted to play in the professional game, I needed to put on, you know, a stone, a stone, and a bit. But it didn't. There was, I never felt like pressurized to do it. I, they, they said, look try and put on a kilo or two kilos in the space of three months. And then when you get to that point, try and keep building on that. Um, and similar to yourself, Emer, I got to um, 90 and then pushed to 92, 93. And I felt I was too, too heavy. I was maybe losing a bit of my agility or it was just tiring for me carrying the weight. I didn't, didn't feel like it was giving me any extra um, potency and tackles or anything like that. And then I found dropping back down to kind of 90, 91 suited me better. Um, and I've kind of just stayed stayed at that weight for a large part of my career. So um, I think it's, you know, I'm sure you, you'd agree, it's something that you kind of find you find yourself, you know, and strength and conditioners can, can advise you as much as they want, but I think ultimately it's how you feel, feel in your own body. It's totally. But the cool thing about it is, like, you've obviously got your fighting weight, and then Ema's got her fighting weight, and um, mine's actually changed, funnily enough, in the last 12 months. Has the games changed? You know how, like... Everything from attacking systems, defensive systems, they change all the time. And that's the beautiful thing about teams getting better and better because then you've got to chase it and get better and better as well. So with that comes a kind of change in mindset that if you're needed to, you know, execute on certain things for your role for a different type of game, kind of, you know, it might change your, your kind of uh, mindset on, say, from a, not a physical sort of sense, but... Um, a mental kind of sense. So, for example, since the last Six Nations this year, um, I found that my fighting weight is now, but that's a few kgs less than what I was. Um, and it was just by fluke. It wasn't, uh, it didn't, I didn't intend for it to happen. But um, so now it's, you know, it's actually working better for me, but I didn't know that before. Whereas last year or the year before might have been that for our certain game plan, I needed to be a bit more, you know, whatever it was, heavy or whatever it is. But, um, yeah, it's an interesting thing. It's also very interesting, not interesting actually, it's really important that um, if there's any young girls watching this or whatever it is, to not be as conscious, you know, at the stage of your, um, if you're playing rugby and those sorts of things, because the main thing is that you're enjoying it. And, um, you know, for me and Emma, we're enjoying it at, you know, the, whatever our sort of size that we are at this stage of our career with the support of our ECCs, but um, yeah. Interesting, uh, interesting uh, question. So. Yeah, I absolutely yeah, no. agree, Sunny. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And you've done quite a lot of work with the with the body wise, and I suppose in relation to body image and all that. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, sorry, Ian, you might have wanted to jump in there before. No, 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 um, no, no. I was going to ask a similar question. <laughs> um, yeah, Emma, for the last few years. Um, I've been involved on the board of directors for Bodywise, which is the National Eating Disorders of Ireland. And um, it's been an interesting time in the last six months throughout this pandemic for, for so many, pretty much every charity in, in Ireland um, and everyone involved. And yeah, maybe it's a, it's a great time to acknowledge all the hard work that's been going on behind the scenes by everyone involved in all of the different charities throughout Ireland. 
super, super challenging time. For us, from a service provider point of view, a lot of our programs are done online. Um, and so we've been able to do a lot of research behind um, different key themes of what's, you know, what are some of the serious issues and they've jumped up like, you know, from 150%, something ridiculous. So um, yeah, it's been, it's been a busy time for our, for our charity and body wise in terms of managing the services and the demand for services. So um, yeah, it's good awareness opportunity. So thanks guys for, for asking the question. Absolutely, no problem. And Sunny, you do quite a lot of work with Guinness and Guinness have done fantastic work this year in particular in promoting the women's game, I suppose, both by the first ever player of the tournament and Emily, um, Emily Scarlett has won that and deservedly so. What a fantastic player. She is definitely someone that I would looked up to in the rugby world and also by them promoting the women's jersey and the sale of the women's jersey in stores. Yeah, Guinness have been a long time partner for uh, the women's game, but obviously with the men's as well. I absolutely love working with them. And I'm just not just saying it because I do, but um, the the partnership between Albury's was and um, uh, Canterbury was to support the sale of the jerseys, the old new women's jerseys across all of the pubs. But a number of different campaigns that are, you know, going to spearhead and I'm just really fortunate to partner with them to help activate and um, support as well. So that's been really cool. Been um, a challenging time for pubs too these days. So um, look, it's um, yeah, it's 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 fantastic to have someone like Guinness to support the women's jersey. Yeah, it's great to see um, you know aspects like that, like the women's jersey coming out. Even you know recently with um, with the provinces and the national team, when there's a photo call for a new jersey, that you know that the women's team are included, and you know I think that's great. Team at the weekend, you know, an all women's. Com, you know, commentary team was, was great to see and it was great to see it so well received as well. Um, so, you know, you know, going forward, like what further improvements would you like to see, you know, within the women's game, um, you know, be it in the school system or, or even, profe you know, professionally for you guys? Oh, we've only got like two minutes, eh? <laughs> 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 like, how long have you got? Let me get my list out. <laughs> yeah, I'll super take exciting notes. Time. <laughs> uh, super exciting time for the women's game overall. Like, you know, next year is a golden ticket for for the women's game globally with an Olympics and a World Cup within a few months of each other. Probably the only governing body to have that opportunity to grow the game is because, you know, and it's already the fastest growing team sport in the world for the women's for women's sport in general. Um, yeah. yeah, it's it's um, it'll be good first and foremost to get some games played in Ireland. That's the first step, isn't it? You know, to get our energy AIL club up and running. And there's been some brilliant work done across all the clubs, uh, thanks to the volunteerism going on, who the backbone of rugby in Ireland and sports sports in Ireland, really. But um, yeah, it'd be just good to get some games back up and running and. Um, taking things over for the next sort of, you know, eight, nine months, once, once we can, and even sooner into December with some of the trainings. But, um, yeah, once a clear and, you know, pathway is established and we can just sort of stay focused on, um, what the international team needs to do, which is, uh, qualify for this world cup, then, um, yeah, that'll probably set things off for what will be, um, next an exciting few years for, for us rugby. Yeah. And rugby. I've no doubt you guys will step up for the um, for the qualification. I was talking to Emer during the week. You know, if you do, if you guys do make it, the group uh, draw has been you know reasonably favourable. I'm sure you guys are pretty happy about that. The uh, the USA's and the Canada's is it? <laughs> you've avoided you've avoided the Kiwi branch and the English. So looking from the outside in, it looked like it was a good draw. I was looking at the other side as well, and even if we don't qualify originally, even that repertoire draw isn't the worst. You know, I don't think it's the worst draw we could have got. I think we would definitely favour ourselves up against the USA. I think we played them in 2018, I think, in a November warm up. And I think we have improved significantly. I think our systems are better. We have gelled as a squad much better. Um, I think we definitely put it up against the USA. Canada are a different kettle of fish. I think they are. They're a phenomenal team. They finished very well in the last World Cup. I think they're sevens and fifteens programs. They feed into each other and they they are a very, very strong team. But I suppose we have to get there first and hopefully we can get some games played in the meantime. 
Um, I suppose that's the most, that's the thing we're looking forward to the most is actually getting some games. Like, I think I personally have only played two games this year. Senna, you've played um, four games this year. I think international games, is that right? You know, we haven't had a lot of game practice with Interpros cancelled and obviously the AIL at the moment postponed. So I think that's the hardest part is getting getting game time in. I think we can all, yeah, you're right, Emer. I think we can all take some hope though from a team like Argentina. Zero yes. games come out and uh, beat All Blacks in their first game and draw with, with Australia in their second game. So, yeah, it's an interesting, interesting time. And it's like, yeah, might not get enough games, but in terms of, you know, the next game would be cool to have the opportunity to play in them. So, Sene, before our call started, we asked you to root around the house and find three things of rugby memorabilia for you um, for our House of Rugby Challenge here today. So the three things that we asked you to find were one, a piece of rugby memorabilia, two, a jersey you have swapped and held on to, and three, something that you treasured that is non-rugby related. So we'll start off with the very first thing. So a piece of rugby mm. memorabilia that you found. Gee, but these, these are um, some great questions. Mine would probably be, um, oh, a memorabilia. It'll be a jersey. Can I say this? It'll be probably my barbarian jersey. Oh, yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, it would be my barbarians, my first barbarians jersey. Um, we played England and took it in. The second one was against uh, Wales in uh, Principality Stadium. And the reason why that would be um, the top of my list and the barbarians is obviously a special um club to be part of but um probably for what it represented you know in terms of all the clubs coming together countries um because obviously this goes without saying that one of my most important jerseys is the Irish jersey so um yeah barbarians would be my memory but yeah very nice um was there any Irish woman playing that day with you the very first time you played yeah Claire Malloy oh and yes yeah, number what seven yeah oh She's something no else she woman. is. No better yeah, woman to be standing there with. Um, which jersey have you swapped and held on to then? Mm. So we actually, um, we don't really get the opportunity to swap jerseys, do we, Emma? No, we don't. Uh, it might be a bit awkward as well to take them off in front of, uh, in front of people too. <laughs> but, but, um, <laughs> <in jersey. laughs> um yeah, not even afterwards, eh? And sometimes, you know, if you get the opportunity to swap. But um, mine would be something I've held on to. And it's actually, I've got it here. Actually, as you said, it's, um, you probably can't see it, can you? Oh, yeah, we can perfectly, it's actually, yes. Um, it's actually a newer version. It's the very first team I played when I was 13, North Otago Rugby. Um, there's a sort of a jersey that is a special jersey to me, first team I played with, and... My brother played for their team as well. It was like a provincial team. Um, okay. And I wanted to play rugby because of him. So uh, it's my first uh, first jersey and it's got 10 on the back as well because that was my first position. Very nice. Yeah. Ian, do you have any jerseys that you swapped and held on to? Putting you on the spot now. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've swapped a good few jerseys um, over the years. We're, we're black, we usually get given two. So, um, usually get to keep one and swap one. Um, I remember my first cap was uh, in the Six Nations against France. And I remember Freddie Mishlak was someone who I used to really look up to growing up. And uh, he was you know, at the other end of his career and he came into the, into the change room afterwards and said, look, he'd heard that it was my first cap. And he chatted briefly in my pigeon French and his pigeon English. And he gave me his jersey, which I thought was really classy and a moment that I'll never forget, you know, and I think that's something that's really special in, in our game. Uh, I know from talking to Callum Sheedy there, after his first cap against Ireland last week, Johnny went in and, and found him and said, look, I hear, you know, you've you've an Irish dad and, um, you know, you know, Maz from your time in, in Bristol, in his time in Bristol and well, congrats on your first cap and look, I'd love you to have my my, my, my jersey and, and hold on to your own one, you know, do it, do with them as you please. I'm sure Callum will, will get them framed and it's something that, you know, meant a huge amount to Callum and, and to his family and it is it is something that's really special in our game. Yeah, that's interesting. I have a funny story about actually swapping, sending you'll get a kick out of this. Um, the, the USA game, 
that we played back in November 2018 was my first time coming back playing for Ireland after I took that year off after the World Cup and Laura Sheen actually got her first cap that day and the, the USA girls were mad for swapping their gear and they swapped a, a girl one of the wingers swapped the the, her jersey and her shorts and the shorts are fab they're like these really nice adidas shorts women's fit things that we you can't get here and um i wore them to the gym the last day and laura sheen actually reminded me of this story and she was raging because she said every time she looks at those shorts it reminds her of that game which was her first cap and she got that length of the field try a great try that day but she was so yeah. busy digging it digging into the cheesecake that we got for dessert that she missed all the jersey swaps and she missed all the kit swaps. And she's like, I'll never forget that day where, where I missed out on all the really nice kit because I was digging into the cheesecake. But she's like, it was worth it that day. The cheesecake was so good. So we actually oh, spoke about it at the gym last week. It was so funny. But um, oh, she killed me for that. Um, so Senna, something non-rugby that you treasure. What is it? Oh, this one is... Um... Probably isn't in the criteria of what you're thinking, I'm going to say. But I was going to say family. It's not rugby. Oh, yeah. But do you well, know, absolutely. Think, um, yeah, probably my, my family is probably the most non-rugby thing. That's absolutely true. And it must be so hard. The majority of your family are on the other side of the world right now. And I suppose it's difficult. You know, there's obviously a time difference and there's restrictions all over the place in New Zealand are pretty strict with, with everything in Ireland too. It must be difficult, I suppose not having the opportunity to go back and, and visit them. I suppose for the last few months, it must have been hard. Oh, yeah, it's hard for everyone, eh? You know, sometimes some some people we know can't even, you know, get to, to England or like go over the water there to see their family for different reasons within the, the COVID protocols and those sorts of things. So, um, yeah, it is, it is challenging, but it is what it is. And you just chip away with, you know, some of your goals and those sorts of things that you got here to to sort of, you know, achieve and things. So, yeah, it is challenging, but it's challenging for everyone. <laughs> it absolutely is. Well, Sene, it has been fantastic having you on. Thank you so much for taking the time out to chat to myself and Ian here tonight. Um, so thank you so, so much. House of Rugby Ireland, here on Joe, together with Guinness. Game changed. For the Guinness House of Rugby Hall of Fame this week, we asked you all to show us your most treasured jerseys and we got some really great entries this week. However, the winner and the one that we chose was Kev O'Hanlon, who shared this fantastic snap of a little cute monster star created by the Laughing Nelly that has a really cute monster jersey signed by Howlett and Maffey. So congratulations to Kev and for that entry, we have entered you into the Guinness House of Rugby Hall of Fame this week. So well done to you, Kev. So there was more Guinness Pro 14 um, games at the weekend. So for, I suppose first off, um, Connacht defeated Zebra um, on a 47-22 win. Some great scores and tries from Alex Wooten and Tom Daly. Um, Ian, yourselves, you had a great win last night over the Scarlets. I suppose an enjoyable win. Um, you had a crowd there for the first time in a while. How was that? Yeah, it was great. Even you know having a thousand people there, just even warming up before the game, having people watching you and just creates an atmosphere and an energy within the squad. Um, and, you know, a lot of the supporters, you know, reached out to us during the week leading up to the game, saying how excited they were to get in and see us and, and to be able to support us. So, um, no, it definitely, definitely added a lot to the game. And it was great to get another win. We're on a good win streak. That's seven in a row for us now and picking up another bonus point victory. Um, but I think we know last night we weren't, we weren't at our best. Um, you know, we picked up two yellow yellow cards, which put us under pressure. Um, and, you know, having been 12 points up at half time, we allowed Scarlets back into the game and, um, you know, made for a very tight and kind of tense second half. But, you know, in fairness to the Scarlets, they're, they're a good side. I think they're, they're getting better as the season's going on. They had a great win against Connacht last week uh, in tough conditions in the sports ground. Um, so, no, they're, they're, they're a side definitely on the up. And, you know, we're grateful to have not been at our best, but still have come away with a win. Sean Reedy is another man that's got another man of the man, man of the match performance. You know, he's been playing particularly well for you guys over the last few games. You know, what is it? I suppose, what's he doing differently this year? I suppose he's a, he's a really, really good back row and he's continuing on this run of really good form. Yeah, I think he's picked up, you know, three man of the matches that so far this season. He's, you know, he's obviously played for Ireland previously, real attritional player. He's very clever, though. He's almost like having an extra back uh, in the back line. He's like another centre. He's, you know, 
very subtle uh, handling. He's got good footwork. He's a great communicator. You know, he'd lead large parts of our defence. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're certainly very lucky to have him. And, you know, he'd be someone that if he, if he was called up to to the Irish setup again, he'd certainly have earned it. Um, you know, there's great competition in the back row that we have up in, up in Ulster between, you know, Marcel, who's obviously locked in at number eight, and, you know, Jordy Murphy, another guy who's, who's in great form this year. And there's the two Ray brothers, um, Marcus and Maddie, who are pushing really hard as well. So, um I think that's bringing out the best in, in all three of them. In your face lit up there when you were talking about Marcel, is he, um, I say he's some character to have around the pitch. Yeah, he's the guy you want to have in your team. Um, I think before I arrived at Ulster, he was, you know, he was talked about a lot and, you know, I, I naturally expected a lot because there was, you know, internationals coming out and speaking so highly of him. Uh, but I think it's only really when you get to play with him that you realise how good he is, and um, his his ball carrying is just ferocious. Every time he carries the ball, he's you know hurting people. He's going forward, um, but I think as well it's his personality. He's just he's a fantastic guy. He brings great energy every day. He's pumping up the guys' tires around them, um, and he's just a, a fun guy to be around. So we're, we're very lucky to have him up in Ulster, and um, he's he's just you know performing for us week in week out. So. Um, yeah, like hopefully it can continue. Yeah, is you always need someone like that on your team? I feel, and um, I suppose Leinster the other day, someone who was busy and all all the time, you know, was um, Luke McGrath, another man in the match performance for him yesterday in that win, forty five win over Cardiff yesterday in the RDS. Um, Leinster, they're just. I think the main talking point of the game yesterday was. The, the youth that are coming through with Leinster, you know, their their conveyor belt, like they had Sylvester come on, that Scott Penny got two more tries, um, Ryan Berry starting again, you know, it's just the the quality that they have coming through and they all just slot in seamlessly. And I think that was the main talking point. I think people are sick of talking about Leinster and, you know, their dominating performances, but I, but this is the reason why. And it's that conveyor belt that people are so often talking about these days. Yeah, certainly. Um, it was great to see the all all female commentary and support staff uh, at the game, and you know it was received really well. So well done on that. Um, but yeah, no, the um, the Lens the young lads coming through Leinster are, are, are quality. You know, the, the sub academy and academy system leading on to a development contract is, is working really well. Um, but I think that the pillar of their success over the last few weeks has been the likes of you know Luke McGrath, Reese Ruddock, guys who have aspirations of playing for Ireland um, and are pushing really hard to get back into the squad, they're playing out of their skin and, and, and that's, you know, going to be driving on the younger, younger lads. You can be sure that they're the ones driving the standards in training and um, you can see that they're they're wiping the board with the teams they're coming up against. Yeah, am I right in saying that Reese captained Ireland to one of the games in the World, Rugby World Cup last year? You know, Reese went from, from someone like that to dominating Leinster and hopefully we do see Reese getting back back into that Irish squad even though you know that back row is so competitive it's it's hard to figure out where he would where he would slot back in into that Irish team yeah I think he'd a slightly disjointed mm -hmm. year last year you know he picked up I think a couple of hamstring injuries um but like he's come back after the lockdown and he's he just physically looks in brilliant condition um how he's carrying the ball he's obviously been playing number eight a bit but I know from playing alongside him when he's playing number six, he just gets through a ferocious amount of work, you know, whether it's carrying the ball, hitting rooks, or, you know, making double double figure tackle count. Um and, you know, there's no 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 doubting that he he definitely add value to that Irish back row if he was called up. So I suppose most importantly, Munster take on Glasgow tonight over in Scotstown. So we're hoping for another Munster win and another seven out of seven for the Irish provinces. Um, it was great to see John Klein back in action and really looking forward to that game. Um, that's it for House of Rugby today. So cheers to everyone for watching and listening. A big thank you to producer Pat, Paul, Dermot, Ian, Anthony and everyone that helped getting the show together. This has been House of Rugby here on Joe together with Guinness. Sloan, go full. Sloan. House of Rugby Ireland, here on Joe, together with Guinness. Game changed.